So hello everybody, I am Leanne Turpak and I am Godfrey's Analytics Director. I'm absolutely thrilled to be announcing our next speaker. It is marketing entrepreneur and thought leader, John Miller. John is currently the co-founder and CEO of Engageo, an all-in-one platform for account-based marketing, or ABM. Previously, John was a co-founder at Marketo, a leader in marketing automation. John also has authored multiple marketing books, and he certainly has a passion for helping marketers everywhere. So now we're ready to hear from John on the next big thing in B2B marketing. In the fact, the ITSMA says that ABM delivers the highest return on investment of any B2B marketing strategy or tactic, period. In his presentation, John will talk about why ABM is generating so much buzz and he'll give some practical tips for launching or scaling your own ABM programs. So everyone, please join me in giving a warm welcome to John Miller. All right, well, hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here and talk about account-based marketing. I'm just curious, before I get started, how many people in the audience here today would say that you are practicing account-based marketing? Please raise your hand if you are. All right, we got one or two, three in the background. How many people here have heard of account-based marketing? All right, a little bit more. So, you know, I, I believe, as we just heard, that account-based marketing is sort of the next big thing in B2B marketing. Uh, for people who have spent, you know, the last five or ten years adopting marketing automation, lead nurturing, lead scoring, all these concepts, you know, I think, A, some cases we've realized those don't always work. And B, even for companies where it is working, companies are looking for the next thing. So this presentation is all about this new idea of account-based marketing. You're going to be hearing me talk now for the next 39 minutes. So let me just, you know, introduce myself a little bit more completely as a person as well as a uh, marketing guy. So these are my kids. I'm, I'm a dad as well as a marketing entrepreneur. The fun fact is that my son, Beckett, the older of the two here, he was born the exact same month that we incorporated Marketo. It's meant that it's really easy for me to keep track of how old Marketo was. It's about nine and a half years at this point. Another fun fact is I was born here in uh, Ethiopia, actually on the map here, it's Eritrea, because the part where I was born uh, split off from Ethiopia after I was born there. Whenever people hear this fact that I was born in Ethiopia, I always get the exact same question, which is, John, why were you born in Ethiopia? And I always give the exact same answer. I wanted to be close to my parents. <laughs> that has nothing to do with marketing. A little bit more relevance to marketing is the fact that I studied physics for my undergraduate degree. I spent my summers doing fusion research at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and I actually got into MIT to pursue a PhD. But I, uh, I decided to like, check out this whole business world uh, and give it a try. And gosh, 21 years later now, I don't regret the fact that I studied physics, even though now I'm not doing anything with that. I think that quantitative, analytical way of thinking uh, has helped me to be the marketer I am today and has actually helped to guide the products that I've built. So I think you'll see that in this presentation, especially when I finish on the third topic, which is talking about the metrics for account-based marketing. So that's what we're covering today. I'm gonna to introduce ABM, why it, what is it, why you should care, and then I'll spend the bulk of the time telling you some best practices. How can you get started with this uh, concept in your organization, and then finish with the metrics. Uh, you are welcome to grab the slides for this presentation if you want to follow along or afterwards. Just engage your slash slides. Uh, if, you, if you register there, you'll also get a copy of my ebook about metrics for ABM. You can also just find them without filling out the form if you search on SlideShare. Okay, so let's get into the meat of the presentation. So what is account-based marketing? Well, to put it in some context, let's go back to my days at Marketo. We were pretty well known at Marketo for uh, building a very efficient, high velocity revenue engine. You know, I, I used to give presentations, we called it the Marketo secret sauce, where we talked about how we built this process that generated up to 80% of all the pipeline for the sales team. And in so doing, really built the power and respect for the marketing department. And we thought we were pretty cool with that process. 
What happened though is we started to move up market where we we're trying to sell more to large named accounts in the enterprise. And we also started to try to do cross sell to our existing customer base. And what we found is that that kind of core process that we had built that worked so well for the lower ASP high velocity business, frankly, didn't work very well as we were trying to go after larger named accounts. And so we had to invent new ideas and new processes and new ways of reaching out to these accounts. And that's sort of what's become known as account-based marketing. And as you see here, this data from Serious Decisions, it's a very different function. You know, where marketing doesn't create pipeline, it influences it. Where marketing and sales have to work even more closely together. So we'll go over all that in this presentation. There's a lot of definitions of account-based marketing out there. This is mine. Uh, what I like about this definition is it highlights, I think, four important ideas about account-based marketing. The first, and perhaps the most important, is that ABM is strategic. ABM is a way of thinking about running your marketing department, or at least a significant portion of your marketing department. ABM is always on. It is not a campaign that you run for a quarter and then stop. Right? That's a very important idea to be successful. Second. I'll talk a lot about this. ABM is personalized. The whole idea is that you have smaller target lists, you're not going after everybody, and therefore you can spend more time to be more relevant and therefore more effective with these really important accounts. Third, it's marketing and sales. Frankly, ABM is a misnomer, just like marketing automation is a mis misnomer. Right? You buy marketing automation, you actually have to invest in more people to use it. You know, ABM is a misnomer because it's about marketing and sales. Even more than the traditional marketing automation where there's a handoff, here it's a tight synchrony. Lastly, ABM is about both opening doors at new accounts, but in many ways it's, often, it's even more about deepening engagement with the folks you already know. And that's going to have profound implications in how we think about measuring the success. So a little bit more depth on how ABM is different from traditional demand generation. Most fundamentally, it's account-centric. Right? Salespeople have always thought about their business in terms of accounts. Right? They don't talk about how many leads they've won this quarter. They talk about how many accounts they've won this quarter. And they write the account name on the whiteboard when they close a deal and not the company name, not the person name. All right? The problem is that marketers, we live traditionally in the world of leads. You, know, you log into Marketo or HubSpot or Pardot or Elk or any marketing automation tool, you can't even look at an account. Right? You're looking at lists of leads and lists of people. And this disconnect between marketing, which is person-centric, and sales, which is account-centric, is one of the reasons why these two organizations have trouble getting along. ABM tries to solve that by making marketing speak the language of sales and talk about accounts. And when sales sees marketing coming to them and saying, here are the accounts that you care about, and here's what we're doing to those specific accounts, that's pretty powerful. Second, ABM tactics tend to be more outbound. I love the fact that Laura was talking so much about fish and bait, because I talk about fish and bait. So clearly, we can't get away from this today. The analogy for me is that demand generation is kind of like fishing with a net. You have your bait, and hopefully if your bait's right, you're catching the right fish. But you don't care if you catch this specific fish or this specific fish. All you care about is did you catch enough fish to make your goals or your targets. It's about counting, not specifics. ABM is about fishing with a spear. You don't wait around for the right people at your target companies to swim into your net. You reach out to them with targeted tactics, uh, and, and that's a pretty found fundamental difference. And the third big difference, and I alluded to this already, is that ABM is about expanding relationships as much as it's about new relationships. I personally think it is asinine that most marketing departments are measured only on net new stuff, you know, new leads generated opportunities at new businesses you know, for new relationships. And you know, so much of revenue comes from your existing customer base, and yet marketing doesn't get, quote unquote, any credit for anything they do there at most companies. 
And so because there's no credit, they don't put their budget or their efforts you know, into expanding and retaining customer relationships. ABM recognizes that value happens on both. And so instead of a funnel in ABM, we think about a bow tie, landing relationships and expanding relationships. So as we heard at the beginning, because ABM is got all these differences, when done well, it really does deliver great results. Lots of reasons why, but most fundamentally and most simple to explain, if you can put all your marketing behind the specific accounts that you and sales agree on, of course you're going to be more successful. It's zero waste. Lots of other reasons why ABM is, is really, really great. But because of all that, ABM is pretty darn hot. I do think it's the next big thing in B2B marketing. You can see the buzz. You can see the people talking about it. But I also recognize that this is kind of like marketing automation or lead nurturing was back in 2008, where people are talking about it. They're excited about it. But the best practices haven't really emerged, and the technologies to support it haven't really been, become mainstream yet. So that's why I'm here, to kind of talk about how can you all get started with account-based marketing in your organization, which leads us now to the second topic. So to set up this framework, let me talk about one last difference between account-based marketing and demand generation. And that's how you think about your campaigns. Traditional demand generation typically starts with the offer. I have a white paper. I have a webinar I'm, trying, I'm gonna run. And then you figure out, well, how am I gonna promote this thing? Well, I'm gonna do an email blast and I'm gonna buy some pay-per-click ads. And only then do you kind of figure out who you're gonna send those things to. You go into your email tool and you pick your segment. You buy your keywords, you know, and so on. So it goes what, where, who in traditional demand generation. In ABM, we flip that funnel around, and we start with the who. Who are we trying to reach? Then we figure out what are we going to say to connect with these accounts, and only then do we figure out how am I going to get this message in front of these accounts. So ABM is a who, then a what, and then a where. And that's the framework I'll use to kind of talk about the best practices. So for the who, the first step in any ABM process is to pick your target accounts. Who do we want to go after? Picking target accounts is to ABM as defining the definition of a marketing qualified lead is to demand generation. It is the fundamental thing you do to build sales and marketing alignment. Right? So how do you pick these target accounts? Well, there's, a mature, there's four different levels of maturity or sophistication to the process. The basic way that most companies do is you go to the sales reps and you say, you each get five or 20 target accounts, whatever the right number is. Tell me who are your targets? Who are the people you want to go after? You kind of leave it up to the salesperson as an exercise. Now that can work because sales is really bought in, but it also can be very limited because sales doesn't necessarily understand what your ideal customer profile looks like and who is going to be necessarily the best, most strategic accounts for you. So you can do better by going to level two with some basic data. You know, do some work and understand, well, here's what we think our ideal customer profile looks like. These industries, these company sizes, these geographies, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then when you ask the reps to do that, give them a list of all the accounts in, your ter in their territory with some of that basic metadata attached to it. They're going to do a little bit of a better job in that process. Level three, and this is a big jump, brings in a lot of advanced, more sophisticated data. And I really think there's three kinds of data that you may want to bring into the process here. The first is what are called technographics. Techno you know, now this is not true for every company, but at least for a lot of technology vendors, the other technologies that that company uses is, can be an important signal for whether or not they're a good fit for you. For my company, I really want to know if they use Marketo and if they use Salesforce. Right? If they do, they're a way better fit for my product. And you can buy technographics from companies like Datanize and HG Data. The second kind of data is just your current engagement data. How many people do you have from that company in your database? How, many, how much web traffic are you currently getting from those, com from that, from those companies? And what's 
you know, the, the quality, overall quality of the engagement. All things being equal, two accounts, one's totally cold, one's got some engagement, the more engaged one's more likely to be a good target account for expansion. The third kind of data is sort of the newest, and this is what's called intent data. Intent data you can buy from companies like Bombora or Prelytics. Um, and what this intent data does is they tie into the ad networks and effectively they can see when people from certain companies based upon their IP address, what kind of web pages are they visiting using semantic analysis. So they can figure out, huh, people from HP are reading about big data off-site, you know, on different content you know, destinations. And then you can buy that data and see which companies are spiking in the, t in the topics that you may care about. So obviously, if a company is really researching things you care about, they are likely to be a good fit for account-based marketing. So the fourth level, predictive analytics, brings all these together. Right? What they do is they, these, these companies like Sixth Sense and, and Lattice and Everstring and so on, they, they, buy, they, they do all the work of collecting the data for you. And then they build a model that sort of is kind of like Netflix. You like these movies? Well, here's other movies you'll like. Here's your best accounts. Here's some other accounts that are like them. Regardless of which technique you pick, I'll give you one tip. Salespeople will have a tendency to think of the target account list as a call down list. Where they're going to call, you know, they're going to, let's work the first one. Nope, they're not ready to buy. Okay, scratch them off. Let's move to the next one. Right? But that's not what ABM is. ABM is saying, we're going to invest in these accounts for a long time with the goal of building a relationship. And so try to have some alignment about how fast that list turns over. You know, I.e., don't let it turn over more than 25% each quarter. So on average, your accounts will be there at least for a year. All right. So I dwelled on account selection for a long time because it's an important topic. Once you've picked your target accounts, then you have to build your database with the contacts for the right people. Remember, you're not waiting for them to come into your net. You're going to reach out to them. So you have to know who they are. You can do that manually by banging on LinkedIn. Uh, you can use tools like Datanize or SalesLoft to kind of automate that process of, you know, you just see somebody on LinkedIn. You say, yep, add them to my database. Uh, or you can outsource it. You can just buy contacts from companies like Net Prospects or Inside View. Discover Org is an interesting company because not only can you buy the contacts, you buy the org chart. So you see the relationships. They're expensive, but it's powerful data. Lastly, some of the predictive vendors, including LeadSpace, will not just uh, tell you which accounts you should go after, but give you the, con the right contacts that they think you should be going after. OK, so we've built the database. We know the accounts, and we know the people. The next step is to figure out what are we going to say to them. To understand this, I spent a lot of time talking to salespeople about what do they want from marketing in an account-based marketing context. This quote from the top, I think, really captures it. Salesperson wants a meaningful relationship with the decision makers. Right? They want to have some relationship with all the other influencers. And effectively, they want to understand the account well enough that they can have a challenger sale conversation with the account. If you're in marketing and you have not read the challenger sale book, by the way, I highly recommend it as a way to understand the latest and greatest of what's happening in sales. Effectively, it says that salespeople should have conversations with customers that teach them to differentiate and that are tailored to resonate with the customer. So how can marketing support this? Well, first of all, marketing can deliver many of the insights that are required to support that. Marketing can help build the org chart. Marketing can help under the salesperson understand the trends affecting that client's industry and the specific issues that happen at that account, and so on. The other thing marketing can help with is building new relationships. Sales doesn't feel like they need marketing to support building relationships with the folks they already know. If the salesperson wants to contact somebody they know and invite them to dinner, they'll just do it. Where sales wants help is relationships with people they don't already know. Now, that's hard because it means you have to reach out to companies and people who you have no relationship with. Right? You have to knock on people's doors. And there's a name for this process. It's been around for a long time. It's cold calling. And the problem is it sucks. I get two or three emails a week, at least, like this. 
where people are reaching out to me to sell me something that I may or may not be interested in, but I don't care because you haven't taken the time to be relevant to me. You get an email like this, hi John, hi Valerie, that does not make me feel like this person spent a lot of time to really understand me and my business. When you get messages like that, it makes you want to opt out, screen out, and tune out. I hit the spam button, and now not only can that person not reach me, I'm hurting their ability to reach anybody. So what do we do? We have to reach out to people, but we can't do the crap cold calling that people have been doing for years. I think the lesson, the answer lies in lessons we've learned from demand generation. If we can reach out to people with content that is about the customer and not about us, that's helpful but not salesy, that's going to be much more powerful than the traditional way. And remember, as I said, in ABM, we can go to the next level and actually use all the insights we've collected to be even more relevant and even more personalized to the account. This sounds daunting, right? Um, now, when you, if you go back to the definition of account-based marketing, this one from the ITSMA, it talks about treating each account as a market of one. What that means is, you know, you, just like you might have a, a market plan for the Northwest or for the financial services industry, in ABM, you create a marketing plan for that one account, which seems pretty weird until you think about the fact that some companies have annual revenues higher than the GDP of many countries. So if you're going after those big whales, treat them as literally markets of one, take the time to research them individually, and perhaps create content for that specific account. Now, you won't do that for every single account. You'll do that for your top 20 tier ones, maybe. Your tier twos, the next 200 accounts, you'll at least do the work to under make sure you have good data, you understand what's going on with the account, and then maybe you'll, you'll, you'll take an existing white paper, slap their logo on it, change the first paragraph and the last paragraph, you know, and so on. The point is, executives will connect with unsolicited marketing if the content is relevant to their specific needs in business. This is a, an email that was actually sent to Howard Schultz, the CEO of, of Starbucks. I just think it's a really good example of the kind of, of impact you can have when you really research the account. This sales development rep in this case, you know, painted a pretty powerful vision of what they could do if they connect, you know, with what Starbucks could do with their company's technology. This is hyper relevant. This is hyper personalized, and it's bold. And you know what? This, in this case, it was a 24-year-old sales development rep. They got a meeting scheduled with Howard Schultz. Relevance really can work. Okay, now we're on to the third step. We've understood who we're going after. We've understood what we're going to say, and we've created messaging and content that will connect with them. Now we have to get it in front of the right people. And there are a lot of tactics you can use. Events remain the biggest portion of most B2B marketing department budgets. And it's a really big part of ABM, and it's sort of what's traditionally sat in the quote unquote field marketing function. There's really kind of two, two ideas here. There's events you own, and then there's third party events. Your owned events might be a dinner, it might be a seminar. Um, it could be a webinar you run for one single account. Right? Or maybe you hold, you, you hold an event, but you purposely locate it next to the headquarters of one of your most important target accounts. Lots of different ideas there of what you can do. Um, and then you can do meetings at third party events where you're trying to set up, pack your sales rep schedules with meetings with the right people who might be attending that event. Now, many times you won't know who's attending the event in advance. So then what do you do? Well, you can do some fun stuff. At Marketo, we used to run a program for the Dreamforce conference, which is the Salesforce user conference. It was our biggest marketing program every year, besides our own summit. We would run a campaign called Upgrade Your Dreamforce to VIP, or Bling Out Your Dreamforce, where you, people would register to, as part of this campaign for the opportunity to win a VIP pass, first class tickets, 
upgrade to a suite, limo ride to and from the airport, all that kind of stuff. And basically, it was a drawing. You know, and we would promote the hell out of this thing months before Dreamforce happened. But the value of it is what are we getting? We're getting a list of people who are coming to Dreamforce that we can use to set up meetings for our salespeople in advance. No matter what you're doing, your own events, third party events, here's a tip. Your salespeople can invite people they know already, so they don't need marketing help. So therefore, but marketing, you can't get an executive to come to your dinner just by sending them a cold email. Right? So if you want an executive to come to one of your events, the invitation has to come from an executive at your company of equal or higher title. And it should be relevant and it should be personalized. And that's how you're going to get executives to connect. Another tactic, sales development. Out, business development reps, outbound sales development reps. Hitting the phone, sending emails, reaching out on social. This is a key part of your ABM out, outbound efforts. But remember, they are not cold calling here. They are armed with all the insight that you've created. They're armed with that specific messaging, that specific content. In that world, you can't measure them on number of dials and number of emails sent. You have to measure them on the quality of the interactions, because that's what ABM is all about. Direct mail is another channel people use in account-based marketing. And frankly, it's making the comeback in the world of ABM, partly because it cuts through the noise, right? How many emails do you get per day versus how many direct mails do you get per day, all right? Now, the cool thing about ABM is because you're going after a smaller list and, and a very well scrubbed list of higher level people, you can use more expensive, more valuable offers. The classic offer in direct mail for ABM that I'm aware of, back in the late 90s, Ariba sent a list of about 200 CIOs, uh, a, a Porsche Boxster remote control, a remote control Porsche Boxster, which was really cool back then. And the email or the letter said, you know, if you want the controller, you have to take a meeting. It worked really well. Marketo is right now sending out these little mini drones that have a message saying, let your marketing fly. And then there's a company called Hello Bond, which is pretty cool. You can, you, either over email or your phone, tap out a message to somebody, and then their robots will actually write a handwritten note in your handwriting and send it to that person, right? I have a customer right now at Engageo. They are part of their lead nurturing. They send to their top 50 people a business book every month. Just, you know, it's part of their nurturing. Hey, here's a book you might like. So direct mail can be a really important way to reach out to these more narrow lists. And lastly, there's display advertising as an important tactic. Advertising has really made a comeback in the last three, or has, has gotten more sophisticated in the last three years because you can reach out to specific accounts. So IP-based advertising, right, where basically you, you, you say, I want my ad only to show to people who work at Clorox. That's really cool because the ad only shows up at Clorox. It's also not great because it shows up at everybody at Clorox, including the janitor. So you can also do proactive retargeting where you onboard your data or you use third parties and say, I want to target people who work in marketing at this list of 20 companies. Now that's great because you're targeting the exact people you care about. The match rates aren't great. You may only get 30% of them or 50% of them. So maybe you're balancing your IP with your proactive retargeting. You can do LinkedIn ads, many of you are familiar with that. I personally think Facebook plays a really powerful role as a way to reach out to people. There's this company called Telemetry. They wanted to get a partnership deal going with Amazon, web services. So what they did is they wrote a blog post that was highly relevant, highly personalized to Amazon about how their product and Amazon's Lambda product would work together. And then they bought a custom Facebook audience of people who worked at Amazon web services and then they promoted that blog post into their feed. Two weeks later, they had a meeting with the right people at Amazon. They made the outbound into inbound. Now, the code of that story is Amazon liked it so much they bought the company. A couple months later, they actually acquired telemetry. So display advertising done well can be a big part of your outbound outreach. All that said, you know, I just talked about a bunch of tactics. You'll have the most success if you don't think about it as a single campaign, one tactic, right? But instead, orchestrate them all together into integrated plays 
right? So your direct mail is your percussion, and your SDRs are your wind instruments, and your ads are your strings. How do you make those all work together in harmony? So I like to think about a, a set of different plays um, that, that help you reach out to the target accounts. So for example, the play I call Open the Door. Right? You don't know them, you want to get into the account. So uh, we ran a campaign like this at Marketo, where we targeted a company and we direct mailed them a box that had um, a customized letter, a printed ebook, and a box of marketing fortune cookies. So the idea, and we went to the executive, the idea was maybe they look at the letter, that gets in the recycle bin. If we're lucky, the ebook, because it's thick and substantial, gets you know, on their desk or into their briefcase, and then the cookies go into the kitchen, because they're not going to eat all the cookies themselves. But now there's this big Marketo logo with all these fortune cookies that have Marketo fortunes in them that the rest of the team sees. All right? As soon as, now this package was sent by a FedEx, and the vendor we used, as soon as the package was signed, that put a signal back to Marketo, which then triggered a whole series of emails and phone calls with service level agreements. We ran this a couple years ago before we could do advertising as well, but even, it would be even more powerful if two weeks before this whole thing happened, we also were hitting that account with targeted ads. Even that said, this campaign had a pretty amazing 63% uh, connect rate, i.e. 63% of the people we targeted, we ended up having some live interaction. Even if they're telling us, no, I'm not interested, there was a human interaction from almost two thirds of the people we targeted. So the deal accelerator, this is another important ABM use case. Now what you're doing is you're targeting the existing open opportunities that your sales team is pursuing. The reality is the sales rep is probably talking to maybe four or five or six people at the account. What about everybody else that might possibly be matter or be an influencer or be a future user? Marketing can help improve the deal velocity and win rate by surrounding that account with supportive messages. Maybe it's just doing targeted ads you know, that hit the whole, all, the, all the right people in that account. Or you can go further with emails that target the account, direct mail, and so on. Human nurture, you know, I'm one of the guys who helped invent lead nurturing, and yet here I am saying, perhaps for your most important people at your most important accounts, you shouldn't leave your nurturing up to a machine sending an email every couple of weeks, right? Actually have your salespeople and your BDRs build a human relationship over time with relevant personalized messaging, maybe the occasional direct mail or a book, and so on. Meetings creator, this is a lot like the open the door that I talked about, except in this case, you probably know who the people are. You have some context of a relationship, you know, previously with them, and you can exploit that existing relationship to increase your chances of getting the meeting. And lastly, the count qualifier, this is just an idea to think about. This is for your inbound leads. But just because somebody stopped by your booth at a trade show, that doesn't mean that that's the person you have to call when they become a lead. That, that, that stopping by the booth is a signal of interest. If an account in its entirety has enough interest, figure out who you should call and reach out to them as well as you know, the rest of the account. Right? So it's an account-centric view on following up on leads. So those are some of the types of plays you can think about for reaching out to your target accounts. All right. So I'm going to finish now with talking about ABM metrics. How do I measure all this stuff? Now, it turns out that the way we've been measuring marketing, the way I've been preaching that we should measure marketing, doesn't really work for ABM. There's a bunch of reasons. But at the core, it's because marketers are used to measuring leads. And it's not business to lead, it's business to business. All right? So we can't measure leads the way we've always done it. So what about pipeline? Well, let's measure what sales scale is about. Are we generating new opportunities? Yeah, we should measure that. But if you go back to that slide I showed at the beginning about serious decisions, in ABM, marketing is generating less than 10% of all the pipeline. So it's much more about how well is marketing influencing and supporting pipeline creation as opposed to marketing claiming credit. Can you imagine a marketer looking at this $500, 000, $500 million deal that BT just created and saying, yeah, we created that half billion dollar deal because of that lead from that trade show. It's ludicrous. You know, 
But, and also think about like some of the plays I just ran, like, like the deal accelerator. This is an existing opportunity. Marketing is not generating any leads. They're not generating opportunities, right? They're helping, they wanna see, did the deal win rate go up or the, did the deal close faster, right? We need new ways to measure this kind of stuff. So the answer partly lies in this quote from David Ogilvy. It's not about counting the people we reach, it's how well are we reaching the people that count. And to that end, I've come up with five metrics for ABM that I think we should all be looking at. The first is coverage. This one's pretty simple. Do you have contact information for the right people at your target accounts? Are those people engaged or is there an opt-in with them? Right? Imagine sales has 100 accounts they care about. And at the beginning of the quarter, you will only know 5% of the relevant executives. Right? And at the end of the quarter, you've built the database out now with 75% of those contacts. Sales is going to be pretty happy. That's marketing victory lap number one. The next metric is awareness. Are, do those accounts know who the hell you are? One way to track that is by web traffic. Are, is the traffic from your target accounts going up? If so, you're probably increasing awareness. I think a more subtle way to track that is to use not just web activity, but activity across all the channels. Are they opening emails? Are they attending events? Are they taking meetings? And rolling that up to something I call an engagement minutes. How many, are they spending minutes with you and your company across these different channels? So another metric for awareness is how many accounts have spent more than zero minutes with us in the last three months? And if that's going up, your accounts are more aware of you, that's marketing victory lap number two. Engagement minutes go further to, I think, a really, another important metric, which is, OK, they're aware of us, but in, are the right people spending time with us? And is that engagement going up over time? So you can look at the org chart for, your, for the company or the heat map and see where are people, which types of personas are spending time. And if you know that you need this person and this person to be engaging with you, or you are unlikely to close the deal, and they're not engaging with you, that's a red flag. But if you can show that that engagement is increasing for a specific account or across the target accounts, that's marking victory lap number three. Our, the accounts you care about sales are spending more time with us. That's a good thing. There's an applied other metric in all this, which I call the Marketing Qualified Account, or MQA. This is a, a similar to the MQL, Marketing Qualified Lead, but instead of being a single person, you're looking at the aggregate engagement for that account and looking to see if that whole account is engaging with you, and if so, that's a good thing that you want to be generating and handing off. So those first three metrics are really kind of funnel metrics. My last two metrics are about your program and program ROI. So the first is program reach. Are your accounts reaching, are your marketing programs reaching the target accounts? If you hold a cocktail party and there are 60 people there, you're paying for every drinks for every single one. How many of those 60 people were from the target accounts you care about? Right? If all 60 were, that's a very focused program. But most of the time you see things like 5%. Oh yeah, they're like sales will show up and say, yeah, there were six or seven interesting people there. How do you increase the focus of your accounts? of your programs. Coverage is a metric for how broad your program reaches your target accounts. So if you have 200 target accounts and a program touches 50 of them, then that's 25% coverage. So it's a good early, early stage metric to track if your programs are working. Impact is a late stage metric to map track if your programs are working. And here's where you have to look at correlations. I don't believe attribution works in complex account-based marketing because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of touches that happen across large account over time. So you can't take you know, that deal and cut it up across all those different thousands of touches. It's false precision. So instead, I like to find correlations. Did the accounts that got the ads have faster deal cycles? Did the people who attended that event, did we increase pipeline for the population over the next six months? Right? Are the more engaged accounts more likely to have better net promoter? When you can find those correlations, that's how you get the data to prove your account-based marketing is really working. 
All right, let me finish with just one slide to talk about account-based marketing technologies, because there's a lot. And I mentioned some of these throughout the presentation. So here, I've mapped out ABM into the six major buckets of things you do. Selection, which accounts and which contacts do you want to go after? That's the uh, who for my framework. Insights and content are the what. Help me understand the account so it can be relevant, and let me create account-specific messages. Interactions and orchestration are the where. The ads, the direct mail, the outbound SDRs. There's vendors for all these things. Or, um, and then orchestration is making it all work together in the marketing automation sense. And then finally, there's the measurement bucket. You see where my company, Engageo, fits in. By the way, people always ask me, is it Engageo or Engageo? Right? I like to say it's Engageo. It sounds like a Harry Potter spell for marketers. So we're focused on measurement, helping you understand, and then we're moving left into the orchestration interactions. And you see why we're such natural partners with all the other companies on the left. Again, if you want to get these slides, engageo.com slash slides. There's also the ebook that goes over those five ABM metrics I talked about in more detail. And I, uh, I finish every presentation I give with what I call the tweetable takeaways for those of you who are too lazy to think about what to tweet yourself. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what most people do is they take a picture of the slide and tweet that out, which is really lazy. <laughs> but you're welcome to do it if you want. Um, I'll leave these up where we have a couple minutes for Q&A. But thank you for your time. Thanks so much, John. That was great. So we have a few questions. Where is the best place to start ABM? That's a good question. So most companies start ABM with a pilot. Um, you know, where you say, all right, I'm going to prove out if this whole thing works. Now, I've seen a lot of, you know, usually you know, five accounts maybe, or 10 accounts, and usually larger named accounts. Uh, one way that people want to try to do that tends to be picking one sales rep. Say, I'm going to focus on that one rep's account, you know, accounts, uh, which makes it really easy for the sales coordination. But I think a better way is to focus within one vertical, a sub-vertical. Because so much of the effort here is creating that hyper-relevant, hyper-targeted content that you'll find, you'll streamline your whole process if a lot of the target accounts you're going after are very, very similar. Regardless of whether you start with a pilot or not, as I said, the, this whole thing starts with picking your target accounts in alignment with sales. That's the most fundamental thing. Perfect, thanks. So we have one more for you. Does ABM require replacing marketing automation? So, no. Uh, <laughs> ABM <laughs> does not require replacing marketing automation. Um, Mark, I mean, I founded Marketo. I love marketing automation, right? And it does lots of things that are really important, like lead nurturing and integrating to webinars and event providers and tracking who's downloading your content and attending your programs and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think, you know, ABM goes away. Uh, but, sorry, marketing automation goes away. But <laughs> ABM sits on top of it and complements it with all those account-centric capabilities and outbound capabilities that I was talking about. I think there are a lot of companies like Marketo that have both a SMB high-velocity business as well as a larger, more complex enterprise business, as well as an install base you know, business. I think you'll always see marketing automation sitting really well in the velocity side, and you'll see ABM tactics used in the uh, named account and install base side. Perfect. All right, that's all we have. All right, and now, enjoy your lunch. Stacy Weisel. <laughs>